Uh, good day, everybody. Um, this is the uh, data capture and data processing session of the imaging and metrology track of Oceanology International uh, 2020. My name is Walter Jardin. I'm uh, BP's Survey and Positioning Authority. I'm one of the co-chairs for this session. And my co-chair, uh, Daryl, will just introduce himself now. Uh, Daryl. Hi, I'm Daryl Lubra, and I'm the Technical Director of Solidine. So we'll be helping you through the next um, uh, four sessions, uh, four presentations that we're going to be uh, providing. Uh, the first of those is from Eric Primo. Um, Eric is actually a colleague of mine. He works at BP as a senior technical uh, specialist. Um, Eric graduated from uh, Plymouth and Heriot Watt Universities in marine civil engineering and uh, hydrographic surveying and also subsea engineering. He's been in the field uh, as a surveyor, offshore manager and consultant on site investigation, inspection and engineering projects. Uh, and then onshore, Eric has worked for a number of contractors in project management and business development. But in 2011, he joined uh, BP as a geomatics manager uh, in the Caspian uh, Sea and then subsequently the North Sea. In 2019, Eric was appointed senior technology specialist uh, within BP to drive technology developments within the global subsea ex uh, execution function. Eric is a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Civil Engineering Surveyors and a Chartered Engineer. So I'm going to hand over to Eric and he's going to present uh, his material to you now. Over to you, Eric. That's great. Thanks a lot, Walter. If you can hear me. Candid, indeed, yep. Okay, well, uh, I'll share my presentation uh, and thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to speak at Oceanology International 2020 under the data capture and processing theme. Um, and I would like to present BP's perspective on the evolution of fast digital imaging, which we believe to be a Renaissance technology. So what is fast digital imaging? Fast digital imaging is a technique, not an inspection category. Fast digital imaging captures high quality images, stills images in place of video synchronized with stills uh, with high intensity pulsed lighting. Fast digital imaging can be employed in conjunction with field gradient CP systems. The point being field gradient is it's non-contact, so you don't have to stop the inspection program. Fast digital imaging can acquire data at up to eight kilometers an hour. Data is acquired in a single pass, processed and reviewed after the acquisition cycle. Fast digital imaging may be configured for general visual inspection, referred to as GVI, or fast GVI, fast general visual inspection by adjusting sensor configuration and geometry. Fast digital imaging is ideally suited for fast ROVs, AUVs, work ROVs, or remotely operated combination unmanned surface vessels and underwater vehicle systems, which is certainly the perceived future direction. Um, and fast digital imaging, because of the nature of the products, the data that's acquired is ideally suited for automated event and anomaly identification and classification. So within BP, and I think within the industry in general, there's five inspection categories, pipelines, jackets, risers, and hardware. And each of those has a component that may be requiring horizontal or vertical inspection and also within uh, operations within 500 meter zones. And obviously all water depths from the beach to the deepest asset. So fast GVI is grossly, uh, sorry, is roughly an, an, an external assessment for gross risk um, to the asset, whatever that asset might be. Whereas GVI, a general visual inspection from a pipeline perspective requires a much greater circumferential visibility um, of the pipeline or the structural member and potentially uh, a cathodic protection or a monitoring of the level of cathodic protection that's afforded to the, um, to the asset by the protection system, whatever that might be, anodes or impressed current. And uh, fast digital imaging has become BP's preferred method for performing 
underwater asset inspection. So BP now has a, a, a specification that outlines the minimum requirements for fast GVI and GVI, and they're quoted in o'clock positions rather than coverage. Fast GVI requires a minimum of 9.30 to 2.30 o'clock coverage. That essentially means uh, about the top 160 to 170 degrees of the pipeline plus seabed either side. GVI requires a greater degree of circumferential visibility, eight o'clock to four o'clock is quoted in the documentation now, um, but also sufficient overlap information to create three-dimensional models, either points cloud or surface models. And again, the pipeline either side, uh, the seabed either side. So BP has now uh, a track record of performing six fast digital imaging campaigns globally, uh, and globally meaning North Sea, Trinidad, and Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Turkey, or the Caspian region, with varying degrees of uh, coverage and speed acquired. And we see the still evolving solution between the type of data, the data that we require, the sensors that we need to acquire that data, how we mount those sensors on the underwater vehicles and potentially how we operate the underwater vehicles uh, from vessel surface vessels manned or unmanned uh, and this is where a lot of remote operations comes into the equation fast digital imaging delivers quality products that we are trying um, to through continued use standardize and normalize within the industry and BP now is certainly not the only company that's using fast digital imaging as, an in, as, as a data acquisition methodology. Effectively, we're aiming to set a new norm for inspection, moving away from videos, contact CP, and much slower, laborious data acquisition methodologies. So fast digital imaging also impacts BP's vision within the low carbon agenda. Uh, within the six campaigns conducted to date, 62 vessel days have been saved employing fast digital imaging technology. That equates on a very average 12 cubes per day to 789 cubes of diesel saved, which equates to 2,052 tonnes of carbon dioxide not released into the atmosphere. Additionally, the saving of vessel days equates to approximately $8.13 million saved in direct vessel utilization. And there's current opportunities to grow these savings through integration with unmanned surface vessels and underwater technology, underwater vehicle integrated underwater vehicle technology uh, and, and, and the whole sphere of remote operations. So a quick outline now um, of the, the, the types of inspection that we require, fast GVI in this case, and the type of uh, history that we've, that we've got. So this is largely, it's not to scale, but the baseline between the port and starboard acoustic sensors um, is about 90 centimeters, less than a meter. So one of the challenges we have with an acoustic system or not acoustic system, one of the benefits of an acoustic system is that we can see the pipeline you, you don't need to have a, a viewpoint from two perspectives. So the acoustic coverage with a pretty minimal baseline and a low flying altitude is still fairly good with an acoustic multi-beam system. About 220 degrees. You can pick up your five point files as you can see quite adequately using that technology. Photogrammetry, i.e. with the stereoscopic images if the cameras are placed in the same location actually can only yield a far smaller field of vision, a, a model. And the, re the, the reason for this is because you can only see or model what both cameras can see. So if you just take the rough perspective of the port and starboard cameras there, you can actually see by the dotted lines that there's a minimal area of overlap of both cameras. Stills imagery also taken from a single perspective, i.e. in this case, the starboard camera is distorted uh, an offset from the model. So although we can get great results with this lower, shorter baseline between our sensors and low flying altitude, there are some drawbacks to it. However, overall, this may suit the needs of, a, of a, an operator, an asset owner's um, 
an asset owner's uh, requirements. And as you can see, the distorted geotiff. So if we now look at how we can improve that, which is now instead of a stereo, we've got a triple camera perspective. So we've got the same acoustic coverage, same five point files, but this time, if we put a center camera in it, we've actually got much greater photogrammetric cover. So we, we have a triple camera and you can see the field of view, the overlap between the images is greater using triple camera. It's in the order of about 170 degrees. And again, the, the motto here is you can only see what you can see. The stills, and the stills mosaic and imagery mosaic for the 2D geotiff, basically the plan view is now a lot more symmetrical, um, meaning there's far less distortion and, and the overlap is, is, is significantly improved to give you a much wider corridor of visibility. We, what the, the challenge we still have with this rather short baseline, this, this approximately less than one meter baseline, is actually looking underneath the pipe to see what happens in the transition zone between the seabed and the pipeline, as indicated by the, the red uh, circles. So the way we improve our visibility here is to, um, to bear with me, is to uh, broaden the baseline to what we have determined through experience of being about two and a half meters. We've still got the triple camera perspective. The multi-beam coverage is, is adequate, but with the larger perspective, we get slightly more um, photogrammetric coverage for derivation of uh, photogrammetric extracted points clouds or, or surfaces. We also used pulse lasers and lighting uh, at the outer camera locations to get more coverage in this area. And we have a stills synced forward camera. And a, and a lot of this is to do with providing the pilot information because now the pilot is not navigating through video because potentially they could be above the pipeline, they could be out of visibility. Um, but in addition to that, um, we're, we're actually looking at, at how we're gonna move this technology into unmanned and remotely operated systems. And this here is, a, is a, a schematic of the actual setup that we utilize for our um, inspection. And you can see that the outer port and starboard cameras are actually tilted inwards. There's one other scenario which actually has not made any industry ground at the moment, but we're looking at for very good reasons. And that is to have a five camera dual port and dual starboard perspective, which actually removes the need for lasers so the, 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 the port camera gives you an adequate uh, port stereoscopic visibility. The, the dual starboard camera gives you good starboard photogrammetric coverage. And with the, two, um, with the center camera, you get a great 2D overlap um, for creating your overall geotiff. So this geometry really is providing us everything we need, the full coverage, which allows us also to go full velocity through the inspection cycle. And again, a synced stills forward camera. These are some images of the, the configurations that BP has employed in various regions, fast ROVs, work class ROVs, um, to, to, to actually perform um, the, the, the inspections, fast digital imaging inspections, which have been tremendously successful over the last three years and six campaigns. What we have here is a classic three-dimensional, sorry, three-camera perspective. In the background, hopefully you can understand the model, the, the, the surface, which is actually in this case a points cloud, is presented with, with the port center starboard stills cameras with each of the images within those stills cameras kind of pictured in the frame. And you can see the, the, the tilting of the port and starboard required to actually create the model. And the deliverables are in a single uh, deliverable format that is uh, accessible within the BP uh, corporate data store, but also um, allows uh, interface through the user to, to gather the data and, and look closer at events and anomalies that, that's required. And the detail, this is a, an extracted points cloud model, is actually phenomenal, uh, very high resolution, high quality data and the um, 2D georeferenced ortho mosaics 
a, a very highly resolute as well, probably more highly resolute that I'm actually presenting on the screen. Um, and as you can see, you know, just zooming into a starfish in this occasion, if that was a bit of damage or debris, as well as the fact that you could see potential scarring, anchor scarring or dropped objects or anything else parallel to the pipe, ordnance rocks, um, it, it's easily identifiable and easily accessible and viewable within almost anybody's corporate data store. We have moved this on to structural inspection as well. Now, again, we have a three-dimensional model in the background and each of those green dots represents an image. And unfortunately it is low resolution because it's a pretty poor screen capture, but you can see the principle is the same, but that's for a vertical inspection. And for vertical inspections, we're actually looking at techniques such as visual SAM, visual simultaneous localization and mapping, and actually structure from motion because the relative precision between cameras is not derived necessarily through positioning, that might be the first iteration, but it's actually defined by identifying common points within each image. Okay, a couple so, of minutes, Eric. Five. Hey, a couple be, of minutes. That, that, thank you, Walter. Uh, primary takeaway messages then. Fast digital imaging is BP's preferred technique for inspection, and that's all categories of inspection. Fast digital imaging is a data-focused renaissance technology. Data-focused meaning it meets the requirements through detailed discussions of the integrity engineers and asset owners. Fast digital imaging uh, delivers products compatible with BP and I suggest other operators data, uh, corporate data stores. And in BP's case, this is the one map environment. And fast digital imaging and USV, unmanned surface vessel systems, uh, lower the carbon footprint, lower risk by removing persons from the field. And ultimately BP will review and implement advanced and alternative techniques, inspection techniques to further increase inspection efficiency. Thank you very much. Uh, time for questions. Excellent, Eric. Thanks very much. Very slick and good timing. Um, Daryl, I, I don't know if you, uh, do you want to kick things off? Have you got some questions? I've got a few uh, myself, but um, maybe you want to have a stab and, and we have our other presenters on that, that may have a question or two. So we're going to open up to the floor and maybe we'll start with, with Daryl and see what he has to, to offer. Yeah, so Eric, yeah, very good presentation uh, and very interesting. I, I'm interested uh, on the lighting side because you've shown, shown some fantastic images. This is strobe lighting. Is, is there any challenges there with with providing that lighting, and then also probably discuss the, the benefits and disadvantages of using lasers over additional cameras, and, and that, that in association with the lighting. Uh, yeah, great, great questions, both of them, and you're right, I touched on them, but I certainly didn't give them adequate uh, time uh, through that discussion. Lighting is absolutely critical, and that's why it has to be synchronized so every image has a synchronized pulsed high intensity strobe lighting. I don't know what the actual lux intensity is of the light, but it is, it is adequate. And, and that is actually what, what, what delivers, not, not just having a high resolution camera, you really have to get that lighting at the same time pulsed. And the challenge with the lighting, the reason it has to be synchronized is because the lighting is actually relative to the perspective of the camera that's being used. For example, if you've got out of sync, you flashed, you flashed on maybe the starboard and the, and the camera took on the port, you'd end up creating a whole shadowing effect and you know, significantly degrade the image. So lighting is key, absolutely key. Um, and, and, and actually, unfortunately, the pulsed lighting gives you a higher burst of high intensity lighting than continual camera, uh, continual um, lighting. Uh, so so it, it's much more efficient to burst it. The laser is fantastic. It gives, laser data is great, especially if you actually use, I don't know, a, a time of flight laser or more the type of laser where we actually slice through an image. The, the, the data resolution of that laser data is great. The challenge is that it's actually sometimes too great for our need. And all we're actually looking for, we're not doing an outer straightness here or an ovality check. You know, we just need high quality, imagery that we can create high quality models from. So that's why the proposal for this kind of five camera, dual port, dual starboard and mono center is actually so interesting. 
um, because it's the only way of getting increased circumferential visibility and coverage around a circular asset uh, without using lasers because of the, you know, the, 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 the classic problems of, of photogrammetric techniques needing to view the same point from two perspectives to render it. Okay, uh, I just have one more question and then I'll go to Walter. Uh, sure. You, the, one of the key things is the, the size. You, you're having to increase the aperture. This presents challenges. Obviously, that the, 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 the width of your aperture is, is proportional to the height above the bike that you want to fly at. And if you're doing eight kilometers, so around two meters per second, that's what, what's your imaging rate and what are the challenges with trying to fly at, at lowish altitudes to get the coverage, but high enough to be safe for operational? Yeah, again, all really good questions with an understanding of the, the geometry and the configuration that's required. And also, you know, it is a function of altitude and velocity. All of these things come into it. And really, you're kind of looking for a sweet spot in all of that. You do have to ensure that you have adequate co overlap coverage, not just across with the three images, but a long track as well. Um, and, you know, it, 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 is, it is critical. We, we're generally aiming for about three frames per second per camera. Um, that's kind of the, 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 the approximate uh, in, the image density that, that, that we're acquiring. Now, talking about the geometry, the 2.4 meters, this is what we've uh, identified as being optimum. How you get to that geometry is, re is another really interesting question. At the moment, we tend to use fixed geometry, i.e. rigidly mounted sensors. As we get into electrification of manipulators and booms, you get a lot higher quality control and feedback from the information, i.e. the where is the end of that camera in X, Y, Z, pitch roll and orientation as well, um, to, to, to redefine dynamically the origin of the image. Uh, that is not developed yet. It's, it's, it's under discussion and it's under review, but that, you know, that is how we see being able to move forward. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, I, I, we're almost out of time, but I've got a couple of quick questions. Um, I, well, I've got more than that, but I'll, I'll restrict myself. Um, the, you had an interesting slide at the beginning showing the, you know, the, the track record that we've started to build up at BP or you've built at BP. Um, I, I was interested in your view on, on what are the main factors that um, impact the average rates that you're achieving. I mean, clearly that's that's a key factor here. The, the idea here is to save vessel time and reduce costs and, and improve safety and, and uh, you know, the HSC footprint and carbon footprint. So uh, there seemed to be some kind of correlation uh, between the number of kilometers that you have uh, logged to, to do, uh, broadly speaking, and the speed you can achieve. So is, is that the main factor? If, if, if you've got more pipeline kilometers to do, can you pick the rate up uh, and, and how complex the surveys are? Or is it more to do with the, the the platform that you have the system on because uh, that that varied as well i saw a, bit, a little bit of info on that would be interesting eric yeah that again all really good questions um absolutely if you've got a major trunk line hundreds of kilometers long and you can just keep going down that yeah. line and again the whole point is that, that that you don't stop the inspection you know there is no contact cp required you're doing using field gradient where a cp assessment is is required as part of the survey as opposed to doing lots of smaller, maybe three, five hundred meter or, 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 or you know, minimal, just a couple of kilometers, because actually the inspection cycle takes less than the setup and the, yeah. you know, the, the, the get on the pipe, get off the pipe, calibrate, check your systems. Is it all working? That can take as long as the, the actual inspection itself. So that's actually the real challenge. It, it's far more suited for much larger um, uh, trunk line inspections, I say at the moment, bearing in mind that we're still talking pipelines, um, refining this technique for all the five inspection categories. And if you can imagine going up risers and getting that, you know, that, that, that single run, going into a hull inspection for a FIPSO or, or a hardware, a manifold or a well inspection. Now they all take different techniques and different setup times and different acquisition times, but certainly the, the digital imaging technique where each time you're creating models that lend themselves to year on year trend analysis because you can check one model against another year after year. I mean, there's so many advantages to the, to the output data format over video um, that lends in, itself to automation of, of, in, of the inspection reporting criteria for all classes of inspection. 
Great. Um, thanks. I, I think we better leave it at that. Um, so I, I apologies. Uh, we, 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 we sort of run out of time for any additional questions. Um, but I'm going to hand over now to, to Daryl, who I think is going to introduce our next uh, speaker. But thank you, Eric. Excellent. OK, thanks. Yes. Yeah, so our, our next speaker is Manuel uh, uh, cl on cloud based AI video library. So Manuel Parente is the uh, CEO of Abyssal. Uh, uh, Manuel started developing software in the, uh, from an early age and has been involved in software engineering ever since. He has over 14 years of experience running, running and managing startup companies. Uh, Manuel has experience in, in developing uh, solutions for subsidy operations. His software solutions are, are used by most of the top, uh, top oil and gas companies worldwide. At Abyssal, uh, Manuel is a founder, CTO, and inventor, holding a patent portfolio uh, in augmented reality, deep learning, and remotely operated vehicles. So I'll I'll hand you over to Manuel. So uh, thank you for having me. Um, so what I would like to talk about today is uh, a digital platform and how that enables um, a video library um, that receives uh, essentially telemetry from, from live operations and how we use that uh, to perform um, AI processing in a cloud-based cloud formation. Um, but I, I will give you a really quick uh, general overview of what that uh, digital platform is, but I'll focus much more on the uh, AI and give you uh, uh, several examples of what we've done with, uh, with, with models in AI and in real use case scenario. Um, so the, the, the presentation will be uh, on how we uh, can design, uh, simulate and plan an operation uh, essentially is how we can take uh, real world information and, and uh, translate that into a 3D GIS world, uh, so a digital world. Um, and then talk just a little bit on how we execute the operations and capture the data from, on, from offshore. And especially, uh, I'll, I'll be focusing much more on how we process that data with AI and how we the result from those AI models are uh, be contextualized in the, in the 3D world again, keep, keeping you that, uh, that digital uh, field always updated. Uh, just a quick overview is the, the, the main three components that, that I'll talk about is the cloud, which is the, the, the main system where our, where our users uh, use to manage uh, offshore operations, uh, live or otherwise. The simulator is uh, how we take that real world data and use a physics engine to simulate operations and do virtual system integration testing on, on, on top of that data. And then the offshore is the, uh, the offshore component that we install in the ROV control room. Uh, much more focused on is how we do uh, automatic integrity threat detection in pipeline inspections and uh, 3D volumetric reconstruction uh, based on legacy video and then uh, metadata extraction from video analytics. Uh, in, essentially, uh, in the design stage, uh, this is where our, our, our clients and users uh, log in and have their, their capabilities of creating that, uh, that uh, the digital field. I'll give you a few examples of uh, project setup, uh, creating the field in, in, in 3D. So basically, we, we take information from multiple sources like 3D data, survey information, um, engineering analysis, and uh, we, we create that that uh, digital version from that uh, from those uh, sources or data, um, including point clouds and laser scans. Uh, also, this is used for virtual system integration testing. So moving a little bit on, so this is how now we have a digital uh, 3D version uh, with GIS capabilities very accurately. Um, now we can move on into the the simulation. Uh, component. This is where we plan operations before even going offshore. We're using a physics engine and based on that GIS and CAD data and also data that we extract from the AI components. Uh, when we go into execution, uh, this is where the operation actually takes place. Uh, we have a kit that's, uh, that's installed near the, uh, the ROV control room. Uh, this is where we do most of our operation management but also that's where we correlate video and data sources with tel telemetry. That's later on, uh, th those kits are sending information via satellites to our cloud. And inside that cloud, uh, the data is being correlated together. Um, and this is where the AI comes in. So uh, 
offshore, the, the kit offshore uh, has uh, this kind of uh, feeling. Uh, because we know where all the 3D information is, we can also create uh, augmented reality for the pilots. This is the real world with a digital twin on top of the video live for the pilot. So we, even if he has zero visibility, Ability able to uh, to visualize and navigate, but also correlating data from other sources. This is an example of telemetry from an asset live while while the uh, the ROV is operating. Um, there's just a, a few examples of that in in operation. So the, the capture process is. Oh, Yes, so we're 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 doing the the operation live offshore. How can we extract data um, that's that's already on the cloud? Uh, for us, it's it's uh, it is a use case of how we use the cloud system to to create command centers for for our customers. This is an example in BP. Um, this is where we were monitoring an unmanned surface vessel uh, couple that was uh, also. Uh, that also deployed an ROV, and we were tasked with monitoring all of this operation. So moving on to uh, the processing component and subsea, uh, uh, subsea artificial intelligence. So what we created was a subsea.ai platform. This is, this is going to be uh, a marketplace for machine learning models and annotated data. Uh, so it's going to, and it also going to be a faster data annotation platform. And, and why? Uh, and that's because we need well uh, well annotated data and lots of it and the the main uh and building those models is is, is challenging um so we're 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 going to allow the, our users to be able to access those models but also the critical component that the, the bottleneck of uh, uh of creating ai models is labeling and annotating data so we 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 created ways of making that much 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 faster actually 80 percent faster in, in training uh, ai data um so this is how we do it in in in, in that subsidy. i'll give you lots of examples after after these these slides uh, but we essentially collect the data by post process uh, we can take legacy videos from our customers so we essentially terabytes of videos uh, and we then uh, create tools to for our users to annotate. So essentially, to create all sorts of different models, and then we help our users train the model and contextualize the result in a three D environment. It, that could be volumetric reconstruction, which which I'll show you. Uh, so these are the uh, examples that we've we've done in the past, uh, in in all sorts of situations. Um, one example is automatic integrity threat detection. In this case we are detecting with 98% model accuracy integrity threats in a pipeline inspection. So we're saying, is there or isn't there uh, an asset, uh, an integrity threat in this image? But we're also segmenting with 98% model accuracy where that asset integrity is. So green is bad, uh, red uh, is good. Uh, you'll, you'll see the, 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 the coating on, on that pipeline um, as an integrity threat. Other examples is uh, purely video analytics. So extracting metadata from each frame. Um, what we do is we take in a year worth of operation and we geotag automatically. We analyze the, the, the video overlay and we geotag automatically and contextualize each frame with the, with the queryable data. Uh, so essentially you can find uh, every every video clip in which a specific asset appeared on screen on the last year. Another example is, uh, as I normally say, is, is understanding stuff on screen. And we create models to do that. So if we have a year worth of operation, we need to understand what we're seeing automatically. Uh, an example is um, finding subsea structures, ROV, arms, so that we can take out when we're doing volumetric reconstruction. Um, Understanding if there's a sacrificial anode or not, text on labels, biofouling in fish. Uh, and fish, uh, we, we specifically uh, took on the challenge of, of uh, creating AI models in which we could um, identify fish on screen because it's a hard thing to do. Uh, finding a yellow structure in a black background is easy. Finding fish with all different shapes and sizes, uh, it's difficult and that helps uh, moving, on, uh, moving the technology further on. 
So in this example, this is going to be you against an AI that finds fish on screen on the top on the top side. And the AI will begin searching for fish and will give you a probability cloud when it uh, when it has a statistically uh, high the probability of being a fish. It already found a fish. So in this case, I'll, I'll move a little bit forward. So there's a fish there. Uh, obviously, this is a biased and, and just interesting situation. Normally, uh, the the AI will find the fish as, as fast as a human. Uh, but this is important uh, in the in the next slides. Um, this is also important in an aquaculture setting. Say again, Daryl? Five minutes. That's fine. Thank you. Um, so moving on to volumetric reconstruction, we created an AI model that uses legacy videos and reconstructs in a point cloud uh, and with an accuracy of half an inch. That means that we take a year worth of operation and we volumetrically reconstruct what, we see, what we're seeing independently of the camera or video quality and not using stereoscopic cameras. That allows us to uh, and this is an example from a, a, a real world uh, case that we've done for a customer. So they, they had a pipeline walking issue and essentially a plat movement uh, issue during four years. So they have the first year they had video, the second and third they had laser scans and the fourth year they had video again. And we were tasked with identifying the movement of that plat throughout the years. What we've done was to Volum volumetric reconstruct the first and the fourth year and put it, it put them contextualized in that 3D environment, um, geo contextualized, meaning that so this this well this well head here, uh, if you can see my mouse, um, this well head here is the same well head, uh, sorry, the, the, this plat head here is the same as this plat head uh, it, with a four year uh, difference. So this is how much it moved throughout the, those those years. And that that was correlated with that was um, validated with laser scans later on, uh, that, that accuracy. Um, obviously, with volumetric reconstruction and pipeline inspection, we, 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 uh, we do automatic free span reconstruction and identification, uh, not only based on video recognition, but also with, with, uh, with telemetry. Uh, the real world example, uh, another real world example of multiple models combined is this. Uh, we were tasked with having, with only having this video. So the, the real footage is the only, um, the only data that we had. So with this data, we, we volumetrically reconstructed what we're seeing. And on top of it, you're, what you're seeing is the point cloud reconstructed, but on top of the original CAD model. The difference between what we're seeing in the in the point cloud and the CAD model is the the, the 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 thickness of the marine growth. So we were able to automatically reconstruct and analyze the marine growth in this imagery. At the same time, we're also able to estimate the position of the of uh, of camera movement based on video, so that we could estimate the position of the ROV within half a foot of accuracy because beneath the uh, beneath beneath the spar there's no uh, positioning available uh, nor we did uh, um, analysis on on the on on this metadata uh, so the result is the reconstruction of everything we saw the recon and the reconstruction of the operation itself uh, uh, another example is let me see if i can let me see if I can move the slides here. So with all of this information combined, uh, there's lots of things we can do by actually by combining the, 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 the different uh, machine learning models. So we can take a year worth of video, reconstruct the scene, but also identifying each different component and, and categorize the, those components. And then by using other ma uh, machine learning models like um, automatic status identification of anodes, we can identify every anode that's under a certain threshold on a specific field by just by uh, using legacy uh, legacy data, um, along with uh, much much more other um, applications. So this is about it. Um, I'm I'm open for questions. 
Well, thank, thank you. That was an excellent visual presentation of, uh, yeah, look, re really quite interesting. I'll, I'll let uh, Walter start with questions this time, <laughs> as I, I hogged it. Uh, last That's okay. Yeah, thanks, Daryl. Uh, yeah, really interesting, uh, um, Emmanuel. I, I, some fantastic imagery there, and I think certainly this is the way the industry needs to be going. Um, so, so um, you know, fabulous. I, I, I guess I have a survey background, so I guess my interest is 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 very focused on the spatial aspects. Now, clearly, you're you're integrating large uh, volumes of quite disparate types of data. Uh, you mentioned legacy video data that may have legacy positioning um, uh, systems on board that may or may not be great. Um, you presumably are integrating 3D um, uh, uh, laser scans from um, structures uh, done in the fab yard. Uh, you've got as-built data to try and tie in, which will be subject to, to errors depending on the water depth and the and the positioning systems used, et cetera. And, 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 and unless you integrate all of those systems uh, um, accurately, then you're you're going to result. You're, you, there's a danger that your results are, are not valid for volumetrics, for for uh, distances or changes in, in uh, between between periods of time where where the yeah. systems you've used to collect the data uh, ha has varied. H how do you how do you manage all that? You also talked about global context or world context and local context. H how do you achieve the spatial integrity of all of those different types of data so that you get accurate results? So, uh, thank you for that question. Um, we use a statistical approach. Our our uh, our point is that, well, first of all, from my experience, and if you compare two sources of data from the same uh, from the same asset or the same field, it never matches up. Mm -hmm. That's something that we we uh, we always assume. Um, but when you have two 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 pieces of information about the same thing you have a statistically more accurate representation of that uh, situation and this is where 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 we um if we're using a laser scan um and we have survey information and we place them one on top of the other we we gain information just by just by contextualizing both both of that uh, uh both of both both of that um, sources of data, um, so we take a statistical approach. The more information we have from different sources about the same thing, the more accurate and statistically uh, actually statistically accurate and more confident confidence we have on that data. Okay, so you're using kind of a, a statistical pro approach, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And is this all in, uh, largely, are you working in, in relative space relative to one another, or do you also work in, in the real world with real world coordinates using coordinate reference systems, or, or is it largely in relative space, um, you, you know, where you, you map things relative to each other? Uh, do, do you have a, a format for how, how you work or a way that you work in that, in that respect, um, please? Absolutely. So a great question. So we, it's always in georeferenced uh, mode that we uh, that we work. We never work local in in in, in local uh, differential coordinates. It's always real world coordinates. Okay. And the the system where we uh, contextualize the 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 result from AI, it's a GIS system with three teeth. So even the volumetric reconstruction is GA, GIS accurate. Okay, yeah, that's a. It's not a phrase I've heard before, and we, we could talk for hours about that. But uh, a great, great answer, thank you. Uh, so, I mean, I think I'll hand over to. Oh, well, I think Eric. Well, let's go back to Daryl. You're running this one, so I'll leave that to you. But it looks like Eric might have uh, have a question. But over back to to Daryl. I'll uh, open up to Eric, please. But thank you for that. Um, great, great presentation. Just thinking about the the kind of use of uh, the model, the, the the digital twin that you're talking about, with respect to unmanned and remotely operated systems where maybe you're, you're, you're operating an underwater vehicle, maybe from a surface vessel, but there's a latency, a delay in, in, in all of the reaction time. How, how would you see your models um, providing benefit or, or any input into that kind of environment? Well, we, we had situations where we had to use uh, 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 AI in real time. So you, you have to make a, a, a um, you have to dial out the accuracy when you move on to real time situations. If you, if you, if you, and it also depends on the, on the problem that, that, that's at hand. If you're looking into unmanned semi autonomous vehicles, then the need to volumetric reconstruct may be, the need may be less accurate than we want for survey information for, from live survey. survey. 
um, we can then, so we can do two things, use a less accurate model for live control and live semi-autonomy of the vehicle and keep the raw video file so that we can later on in post-process have a, 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 a more accurate reconstruction from, from, from the vehicle. Okay. So you, uh, you, you, you can dial uh, according to the situation. Okay, that probably nearly brings us to the time uh, limit, but uh, just have one, one final last question, which is you, you're doing some real-time uh, anomaly detection. Uh, is that actually on the vehicle so we can deploy that onto an AUV? And if it detects an anomaly, it can go back and do a, a more detailed survey of that, that area, maybe a visual from a multi-beam or... Absolutely. So, uh, but but in all in all fairness to the current status of the of the technology, the the volumetric reconstruction with half an inch of accuracy takes two, two frames for each frame you're you're uh, you're processing. So that there's no uh, possibility yet of doing that in real time. So it has to be in post process. But there are certain situations and models that can run on an edge computing system um, on, on the uh, on the vehicle itself. So we, but it's I don't consider that that those the same models as as you, you use in post process. So models for edge computing are slightly different, and they have to compute uh, and treat data slightly different because you the the. The, the circumstances is speed and not accuracy. And you don't have all the data by that point, so you can't yep. go forward back yet. Okay. Okay, so I, I think that concludes that uh, one. So over back to you, Walt, to introduce the next presenter. Yeah, thank you, Daryl. This is all going very well so far. Um, so I'm going to introduce uh, Gautier uh, Dreyfus, who's the CEO of uh, 4C uh, Robotics. So Gautier is a petroleum engineer um, by, uh, by, by uh, background, and he has five years experience in the oil and gas industry. Uh, prior to founding 4C, um, he worked for two years as a field engineer, uh, both onshore and offshore in, in Africa. He has also worked for Schlumberger uh, Business Consulting as an analyst for North Sea projects. Um, he graduated from the Ecole Polytechnique in France and the IFP School also in France, but also from the Texas A&M University in, in the USA. And, and I guess, uh, Gautier, that makes you an Aggie, uh, I believe. Um, so Gautier is yes. going to, uh, he's going to talk to us about uh, agile metrology from a PSV, which I, I'm hoping is a platform supply vessel uh, uh, abbreviation. So over to you, uh, Gautier. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for the uh, excellent presentation we had so far. Uh, can you just confirm you hear me well and you see my screen? Yeah, you're good. Excellent. Agile metrology um, is a concept we developed uh, in collaboration with other partners. And one of them is Geofit, which is a French photogrammetry company. Uh, unfortunately, they couldn't make it for today. So I, I, I'm not a photogrammetry expert, but I will try to. Um, to go through the presentation alone. Uh, so just uh, the context, uh, of course, you all know uh, metrology uh, and, and the need uh, for precise uh, measurements between two, two structures. Uh, so usually uh, what, you wanna, what you wanna measure uh, is uh, distances, heading uh, and relative angles. So it's relative between one structure to another uh, and accuracy is really, uh, really key. Um, so uh, the concept we developed so far uh, really started from, from well, technologies together and, and, and technology breaks together. So the first of them is uh, realizing that uh, new uh, LBL network made huge progress uh, and, and uh, the rise of sparse LBL uh, is, is, um, is bringing a nice solutions to the market uh, because it means you, you can have the same accuracy with less, uh, actually less, uh, less sensors. Uh, then for C, uh, we bring the Atoll ROV, which is a, a smart uh, smart tool that can deploy uh, LBL frames on the seabed uh, from very light opportunity vessels. And this is something I will introduce. And then so I have several photogrammetry techniques uh, that have been improved and, uh, and for sure BP and uh, Abyssal also uh, introduce new photogrammetry techniques and, and new imaging systems. So, so what I'm going to present today is not, is not just about one company, it's, it's just a, a a concept that you can um, bring together with several techniques. So it can be any LBL 
sensor, any imaging techniques, and of course, any of it. But today we, we do this presentation and concept with three French companies. So IX Blue, which is a market leader in INS and acoustic companies, in acoustic system, sorry. Geofit, which is a French expert in metrology. And they have a huge track record with uh, some, uh, some of the uh, majors, the EPC in the world. And 4C, uh, maybe a quick word about 4C. We are a young French company uh, created four years ago. And we developed smart hardware for offshore industries. And we, we, we basically focus on repeatable, uh, repeatable tasks. So we develop ROVs uh, and vision systems for automatizing repeatable tasks in the industry. And uh, one, one of these uh, repeatable tasks is uh, acoustic sensor deployment. So it all started. And actually, well, it should be a major. Uh, realizing that uh, most of the time, uh, the constant vessel deploying acoustic vehicles and constant vessel can can 100k a day rather than PSVs are everywhere on the fields, and the cost is usually less than 10k a day. Um, so clearly, there, there is a, there is a need to shift some some operations from big constant vessel to to lighter vessels uh, which are on on field, and most of the times the PSVs. So the farm supply vessels are not used, uh, less than uh, 60, 70% uh, use rate. And, and why would you use a 400 ton crane to deploy a 10 or 20 kilograms beacon? So this was uh, really the first operation. And this is why we started to push this atoll concept and uh, what, what kind of tool can we create to deploy an LDL network and the seabed? And, and the concept I'm presenting here is using the uh, by 4 uh, that could be deployed from a PSV. And, and the first step of the concept would be to deploy a few frames on the seabed, uh, usually three, uh, and then perform the photogrammetry uh, treatment or the imaging acquisition from the same ROV. And because the ROV has autonomous capabilities, you can imagine uh, a pre-programmed uh, flying path um, and, and make the uh, acquisition autonomous. So this is a concept. Uh, I uh, was supposed to present that last February before the COVID started, and we were supposed to organize an offshore deployment in the summer. Uh, unfortunately, uh, everything was kind of standby. Uh, so I'm still presenting the concept, but I don't have uh, any any real data to show you uh, today, unfortunately. So, so uh, a quick word about uh, the Atoll vehicle. Uh, Atoll is a project we started two years or three years ago uh, in collaboration with Total. Um, so Atoll is a smart ROV that can be deployed from any vessel. So you can see a very light survey vessel. Of course, uh, this would be shallow water here, but uh, you can see the vehicle deploying an LDL frame uh, up to 100 meter water depths. So this was the first trial with the first vehicle design uh, we performed. Um, and this is a trial from last year, still with Total, uh, slightly bigger vessel, uh, DP1 vessel, and we can reach now um, deep water depths uh, approximately 1,000 meter water depth. So the vehicle has its own launch and recovery system. Uh, the design has slightly evolved. Uh, so, so let's say the Atoll ROV is a, an OPS class ROV with a hook. Uh, it's like a motorized hook um, and navigation capabilities. And uh, we, uh, we, we just have, of course, a very precise positioning. Positioning is key. So we, we were using at the time IX Blue uh, gaps. Uh, of course, uh, we, we are totally agnostic in terms of uh, of sensors. We, we can use any acoustic uh, device from, from Sonar, so Sonar Line or Kong, for instance. And, and we also perform the boxing uh, with the frames, so just a, a screenshot of the vessel uh, GPS. So, so the first part of my presentation is very visual, huh? but it's just to show you uh, what kind of tool we are de deploying uh, in a very operational context. We also developed a, a, a latching system, a remotely controlled latching system that can be uh, very uh, helpful to deploy and recover from the uh, INS DVL. So the vehicle itself is survey graded and positioning of the vehicle is very important when it comes to photogrammetry acquisition. Uh, and we also have this photogrammetry camera with uh, all the offsets between the uh, ROV reference point and camera uh, controlled uh, by dimensional control. Uh, it's just a quick uh, quick view of the uh, latching system. So we, we can mount a, la a latching bullet on the top of the frame or even on the top of the beacon. Then we use our, our visual docking technique using QR codes uh, for precise autonomous docking. And we can grab and, and release uh, the LDL frames. 
So that's for the Atoll tool developed by Corsi. Uh, and then we started to work with Geofit, uh, this, this French uh, renowned photogrammetry company. So you're probably more expert than I am in photogrammetry techniques, but basically photogrammetry is the art of uh, creating uh, measures from pictures. And what you need is a camera movement because you, you need, uh, like like uh, the presentation from, from BP explained, you, you need uh, uh, you, you need to, um, to um, uh, sorry, you, you need to, to, to see uh, the same point from different image. Yep. Uh, so these are uh, images from uh, Geofit campaigns. Um, wh wh when it comes to photogrammetry, it's um, a key that uh, you, you reconstruct your, your scale uh, with the right tools. Uh, so one of these tools is to um, you, can, uh, you can scale by side of the image, and, and then uh, you use the scale, uh, the scaling uh, information to, to, to uh, adjust uh, your positions. And the other technique, of course, is to use acoustic. Uh, but uh, now, uh, with, with the improvements of uh, the SLAM techniques uh, like visual and, uh, and inertial navigation, uh, probably uh, some of you are already working on. Uh, and, uh, and, create, and using the INS uh, information to, to rescale the, the imaging uh, acquisition. These are some images of the geofeed processing, so I won't have much comments. Uh, unfortunately, my, my colleague couldn't join today. Uh, but basically, uh, uh, the, the geofeed developed a software uh, where, where they uh, recognize point of interest and, and they can reconstruct uh, 3D images uh, using uh, cross, cross images. So processing is very fast. Uh, I know Geofit uh, also also uh, sub, uh, yeah try to try to put 3D models uh, onto uh, onto uh, 3D reconstructions. So this is something that can be very helpful as well to rescale uh, your your images. Um, so it's all about yeah photogrammetric scaling, like I said. Uh, so this is why, uh, when when it comes to uh, metrology, uh, and and usually you you uh, you expect a centimeter error and maybe point one to point five degree error. So clearly, uh, scaling is key, uh, and this is why uh, clients would deploy LBL networks because, as far as I know, uh, it is the only uh, one hundred percent certain way today, uh, an accepted way by by operators to um, to perform metrology. So I know some visual. Uh, Sensors are coming on the market, um, combination of vision and lasers uh, that can perform metrologies. But uh, let's say 80% or 90% of the metrologies today on the market are using LBL because uh, it's a very high TRL and, and clients usually have a, a trust in such uh, systems. Uh, so the track record of Geofit, uh, once again, I'm not, I'm not the best person to comment, uh, but uh, let's say they have a very long track record for the past 10 years in the North Sea. Uh, they've worked a lot with sub 7 so they did some uh, flange metrology, uh, flange photogrammetry, sorry, uh, several metrologies, uh, spool to spool uh, and jumper to jumper. And they're also um, one of the first to use a new, uh, new 3D, uh, 3D targets for even better, um, for even better uh, 3D reconstruction. And the idea here is to, to put a 3D target inside the metrology receptacle. Uh, so you, you have less requirements for the intensity. It's only one target uh, rather than uh, some, some other metrology companies are using tens of targets on the, on the structure. So it means less target and less uh, dimensional control required on the other. And I, I will, uh, and uh, my presentation uh, with a few explanations of what we did with the QR codes um, and uh, where, where our QR codes can be combined with metrology acquisitions and, and positioning. So probably you know that uh, QR codes are everywhere now in the industries uh, uh, and they, they, are, they have started to be deployed even by Equinor on the subsea docking stations, for instance. So this is open source and that's fair. It's important that uh, any, any QR code that is deployed on, on the seabed can be used by any operator. Uh, but what we did uh, is uh, we added some extra dots around the QR codes. Uh, it's like every dot, each dot is a, is a metrological target. And uh, we added some standard uh, dimensional control targets. 
And thanks to these extra dots, um, we reshaped all the algorithms. We, uh, we packaged uh, the, the algorithm and the software inside a, a single hardware. So we don't use any top side unit. Uh, the processing is done internally inside the camera and everything is pre-calibrated. So we, we created this plug and play sensor and each time a QR code is detected, uh, we, we derive uh, a very precise six degree of freedom data, um, position. So we have uh, X, Y, and Z coordinates between the camera viewport and the QR code, but also these three angles. And, and, um, and clearly the differentiator uh, using metrology targets uh, is uh, the accuracy because we have uh, one millimeter and less than 20 degree accuracy uh, with, with such system while uh, standard QR codes usually have a few centimeters and a few degrees accuracy with, uh, with clearly absolutely no, uh, no control of the error budget. So this camera is by itself a real-time photogrammetry uh, system. Of course, we can't we can't uh, the models, but it's very it's like it's the first layer of photogrammetry because it can only reconstruct uh, a known target, which is the this QR code. Um, so we did a few a few tests uh, of straw uh, for pi for instance pi installation with sub seven last year. Uh, so we can measure the position and the inclination of the pile in real time with a uh, survey graded accuracies in real time. Uh, and also uh, structure installation for TFMC uh, still last year on the North Sea. And you can see the camera is, is uh, synchronized with an external gyro. So we have the absolute inclinations of the camera uh, every time. And, uh, and uh, as soon as the QR code is detected, we can, we can measure in real time um, embedded inside the vehicle. Uh, the uh, positions of the structure. So if you consider each QR code as a metrology target, uh, knowing that you have a very precise position between the camera and the QR code, and this is what typically the user screen would give, then of course you can interface uh, or sensor to any survey software such as Navipack or, or, or 4D Nav, QPS, or, or the market leaders of, of survey navigation software. Uh, this Positioning, positioning uh, feedback can be used for metrologies uh, be because uh, basically it will allow you uh, to have uh, fully contactless metrologies. You, you to today, most of the metrologies use the world class ROV that has to dock onto the structure uh, from, from one structure to another. And each time it docks onto the structure, it measures the inclination of the structure. So it takes time and of course money, uh, but you can imagine here uh, that uh, our Atoll ROV uh, uses uh, QR codes on the structures. And of course, you would have performed the dimensional control of these codes on your arm right before the operation. And, and a couple uh, of minutes, uh, go to yeah, you. Yeah, this is my last slide. So basically what we are working on, and once again, it's a concept. Uh, unfortunately, we are, we are not able to deploy the tests. Uh, but what we are working on is uh, deploying very light LBL arrays using sparse LBL. Um, then puts QR codes on the structures. Uh, let's say the cost of such operation is, is a minimum and uh, use a camera and, and, INS, and uh, INS DVL techniques to reduce uh, the error. Uh, and this is what we would call um, agile methodology. Com combining LBL, the new techniques, latest innovation in LBL uh, navigation, INS navigation and visual navigation. Thanks for your time. Gautier, thank you. That's excellent. Um, so we'll we'll do the usual um, double act. Uh, uh, Daryl, I don't know if you want to kick things off. If you have a, a question or two. Yes. Yeah. I, and I I feel this is a really sensible approach of combining visual, LBL, and DVL, INS. I think I think this is a, a provides robustness for for these sort of metrology applications. One, one sort of a very, very simple question is obviously with the QR codes, do you think that we could actually standardize on, on these if they're going to be part of infrastructure, as, as you probably are aware on the, the, the uh, Equinor, they've started to put uh, yeah. on their UIDs, their docs, they've put QR codes. And I notice you've added additional uh, fiducials to, to try and improve the, the accuracy. But there's, all, there's also a challenge with, so not only standardizing the, the, the IUCO codes, but also the detection algorithms for those IUCO codes when, when you start to have biofouling. It'd be interesting just to uh, give us a, a sort of summary of that, that area. Yeah, 
excellent questions and basically you have two two questions in one so the first question is yes of course uh, we we are of course we are a very small company so we don't have a huge uh, um, marketing power but uh, clearly our ambition is to avoid the sub structure manufacturer to Im implement these codes uh, from from construction and from design and construction uh, worst case scenario this is what I, I love to say it costs nothing right it's just some painting and they already are painting letters above the valve so why don't they paint a few QR codes on the structure so it, it costs nothing We have seen by Abyssal, clearly it's a complementary technology when, when you need to, to have very exact position of your, your structure inside the GIS world, the digital world. So yes, we, we are we are pushing for that. And second question is, uh, 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 it's important uh, that the QR codes remain. Computer in and I don't think that's uh, standardization. Uh, but clearly our technology is accuracy. And this is why we need to use uh, additional metrology targets because uh, at the end of the day, if you need to use these codes for real-time metrology or real-time photogrammetry, you need a millimetric and point of degree accuracy, which you want, you clearly you won't have with, with standard uh, QR codes. Yeah. So, so it's a combination of the two. I, th I think uh, uh, my final question is, is when you uh, sort of uh, come on to accuracy, I noticed that the, the, the camera that you're using is a flat port. Uh, what sort of camera model is being used for, to ensure that you retain the accuracy for various pressure depths? And yep. Good question as well. So at first, uh, we wanted to use standard QR codes and any camera on the market, of course, uh, that is the ideal world. But but then we, we started to discuss with surveyors and, and in order to reach a survey uh, graded accuracy, you have an error budget and you need to, to totally control every piece of the of the acquisition chain. To, to get below this uh, the hardware and what we do is we calibrate uh, flat port is better for very precise calibration um, for several reasons I won't explain um, <laughs> so we, we calibrate uh, in a white uh, room and uh, just an example we have four, 15 calibration parameters while the open source uh, open source calibration process uses only six parameters so we go very very deep inside the, the calibration and same for the algorithm. So it's like, a, uh, of course, uh, it's very, I mean, it's open source to detect the QR code. You, you can hire an intern in, in a few weeks. Uh, he will, he will uh, develop something that's fair and that's part of the game. Uh, but if you want to have a bulletproof system with a survey graded accuracies, uh, it's like three years of development with, uh, with the best, uh, like we worked with the best photogrammetric uh, experts in Europe. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Goti. I think we've done well. Uh, just about uh, your internet's just about held up. Uh, a couple of dropouts there. Apologies for that, but uh, I think we've 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 just about picked up uh, most of what you said. I guess a couple of quick comments or a question for me. I mean, glad to hear we're moving away from um, you know photogrammetric uh, measuring sticks. Uh, I have experience of that from over 10 years ago in, in the Caspian and it was pretty painful. It worked, but uh, we had hundreds of them down over a very long baseline, 120 meter baseline, I think, uh, to install a jacket. Uh, and it did work, but it was pretty painful and very, very slow. So great to hear that the technology is moving on and, and QR codes are helping to, to ease that. I, I mean, I guess one challenge I would have might be that, you know, uh, we've moved from diver metrology, uh, you know, with, with top wires to acoustics has ruled the roost for uh, um, uh, metrology for many, many years and been highly successful. Very few, few spools have not fitted uh, because the metrology didn't work, the acoustic metrology. But uh, and, and now we're moving to more um, uh, remote techniques, if you like, without having to physically install LBL yeah. compacts, which I know is Daryl's business, but uh, they, they, they're, they're, they're time consuming as well. And uh, my view was where, you know, well, I guess my, my question is, there's a challenge here from the, the laser scanning uh, industry, I think, is, is 
is, is really the way I, I, I believe the industry needs to be going because you can go down, you can do a 3D laser scan from a mobile or a, a static system on the yep. seabed. You can get a full model of exactly how everything's been installed and then you can measure whatever you like um, uh, from that model. Uh, the, the flange face angles, uh, the, the points that, that you need to fabricate your spool between, yep. et cetera, et cetera. H how do you see that as uh, fitting in with, with the technology that you're promoting here? Because uh, are they complementary or, or are they uh, competing? Well, I said today, it's, everything is complementary. What, what you need today is sensor fusion anyway. Uh, you, usually you need complementarity. Uh, and of course, uh, there is a, a time between the, I mean, you, the market needs time to shift from standard acoustic metrologies to fully uh, fully uh, imaging metrologies. Uh, of course, uh, we, we haven't waited for the market to, to go in this direction, to work in this direction, but uh, uh, agile metrology, the way I presented it today, is a, is, a, is a way uh, to be aligned with the current market. You know, right. most of the surveyors you would see on the use. I know, I know, laser metrologies are coming, and more and more clients are using it. But most of the surveyors and, and users you, you would discuss with uh, once uh, LBL on the field. So the first step is b before you get rid of the, the, all the LBL array is reduce the LBL array size. Then you merge, you merge with INS data, and you start yep. to put some imaging data as well. No, I, I think that that's a fair comment. And and yeah, I mean, we, we, yeah, we've we've become very used to um, the 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 confidence we've gained from LBL over the last twenty odd years, uh, and and uh, but but it is a relative exercise um, that, that we're performing with metrology, and and it's going to be interesting to see how we integrate LBL, INS, you know, video and and laser uh, techniques to to get the most efficient way to deliver. So so thank you for that. Uh, I, I think, unfortunately, I think we're probably out of time pretty much uh, to, to take any other questions. So I'm, I'm going to hand back again to, to Daryl, who's going to, I believe, introduce our, our last uh, speaker. Daryl? Yes, so our, our final speaker uh, is uh, Batuhan Actus. Uh, he'll be uh, presenting on data-driven analysis for structural health monitoring of offshore wind turbines. Uh, Batuhan is a senior engineer at Fugro GB Marine Limited. Uh, was awarded a PhD from Newcastle University for his work on systematic experimental approach to propeller cavitation noise. Uh, his technical expertise covers a range of disciplines, including numerical and experimental hydrodynamics, data analytics, and offshore structural monitoring. He has published over 20 peer-reviewed journals and uh, 30 conference papers. So I hand you over to Batan. Uh, thank you very much. And, uh, study uh, a case study for renewal uh, titled Data Driven Analysis for Structural Health Monitoring of an Offshore Wind Turbine. Today, uh, my presentation will be structured in this slide. So I will start uh, mentioning about uh, the, uh, the motion monitoring we carried out for uh, an offshore uh, wind turbine. Then we'll detail more about the, you know, how we analyze the data, you know, how we track the nature of the feedback into the um, uh, finite element models and how we use this data to integrate and uh, calculate motions and how we correspond in comparison to uh, data and all the Foundation fixed it to further analyze and uh, into the fatigue models and also the finite element piece. And finally, I will move on to draw some conclusions from uh, this study. I would like to express that all this uh, study uh, and case study was carried in the framework of uh, North Star solutions. Which we provide, uh, which we provided to oil and gas industry for uh, uh, combined aspects of structural monitoring to reduce to HSE risks and combine the various data to provide one user intuitive uh, user interface to the uh, operators uh, of every kind and aims to apply this existing technique that we used in condition monitoring of oil and gas structures to renewable sector and demonstrate cost-effective applicability via economies of scale. Of course, this 
what, where you won't need the, all the parts of the node, Google node star, so a, a subset of the services will be uh, applicable to renewable sector to make it more uh, safe and economically feasible. So in the framework of this case study, we have had a, uh, we have uh, we have been asked to monitor two wind turbines, one of which uh, was uh, the experience of loss of scar protection during the commissioning, and the other one was uh, uh, and commissioned as planned. So this actually gave us the chance to composites of data and how the are that. Uh, scar uh, protection damage which affected the dark wind turbine compare how uh, and we used our, our uh, six degrees of freedom uh, which can measure six degrees of freedom motions at uh, 10 hertz it is actually uh, battery powered so it can be deployed uh, for a month, it just only weighs 2.4 kilograms and is a really small footprint. If you can see on the screen, they are pretty, you know, they can just carry be deployed anywhere. So you can actually deploy it uh, wherever you need a, uh, uh, you need to carry measurements to evaluate and have a better understanding of your um, offshore structure. For this case, we have, installed uh, uh, one of them uh, called them lower level is the 31 meter from the mud line and then another one is upper level is night to, uh, to to collect motion data uh, once we get get back the motion data the first thing we look at is the we carry out the spectral analysis and this one out we have our first observation was that uh, as you can see in the this blue circle here this is the first sway mode of the wind turbine and we observed that while the uh, control one which is shown by the blue line uh, was at a higher frequency the scar one was frequency and this is shown as like as you can see see the was 0.24 hertz and SCART one 0.22 hertz. Obviously the main implication of this one is the first blade rate. So when, if the, if the SCAR damage further deteriorates, then the, then the first sway mode of the SCAR wind turbine can further lower down. And in case when it, when it becomes operational, it may overlap, so then it may uh, increase the amplitude of this uh, mode and causing potential structural damage. And, and uh, this is actually, you know, operators would always avoid suspicion about uh, a scar damage. They avoid operating the turbine at all costs. And of course, it will response. And another thing we, we know with other structures as well is to act at mode over it over the time domain to ensure that it it is as you can see here with the blue lines is the control one that is uh, higher up consistently higher up but as you go along after the initial commissioning you can see it becomes operational then more fluctuations are visible but the scarred one is against consistently the natural low down in fact, uh, by the time we pre prepared this presentation and like we did update recently, I think uh, we have observed that some uh, repair has been carried out to this scarred wind turbine, the control turbine, which we hope to present another, at another uh, conference. But again, this is actually a key indicator of your asset in integrity for and this is a very useful parameter for the analyst dynamic response to calibrate their models and they that actually feed into the structural model the fatigue life uh, predictions for their model so important for that purpose 
like analysis we can carry out with the motion measurements is we integrate to give the displacement, calculate the inclinations, provides us. Uh, is it possible to, uh, uh, you're, you're very juddery, is it possible Sorry? to turn off your video so that we can hear you a little bit better? Uh, Hello? 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 I can still hear you. Yeah. I con Hello? Yes, yes. We can still hear you and see your screen. Yes. Uh Okay, so an analysis we can carry out is uh, using motion measurements to calculate the and the inclination. This in turn gives us the opportunity to, to compare uh, both the inclination and displacement measurements against the metal data and uh, see how placement of the uh, wind turbine tower changes with the overall impact of the essentially waves. And as you can see here, uh, you can see the red one, red dots are corresponding to the scarred wind turbine and blue dots are corresponding to the, where the displacement is on the Y axis and uh, significant wave height is in the X axis. You can see the control uh, wind turbine has 1.7 millimeter per meter significant height uh, displacement, experiencing that much displacement whilst the scarred one is experiencing 4.7 millimeter, the three times the uh, intact one. So this is essentially co caused by the weak soil around the monopile and uh, we can see that the motion of the tower. So another aspect of this is the effect uh, torsion conditions on the uh, first sway mode, as well as the consequent displacement of the tower to this uh, natural frequency of the tower. So once the motion, uh, the, like the, once the soil around the tower is disturbed, the motion uh, of the tower will be much more. So, and we on the previous figure, but also this has a direct impact to the natural frequency of the uh, tower as well. Here, the control turbine, uh, the natural frequency decreases 3.7 hertz per millimeter displacement, while the scarred one, the 0.6 hertz per millimeter displacement. This in turn actually takes us back to the, um, the power spectral density. So if the scarred wind turbine increases quicker with the motion conditions, this that in, in a case where uh, like high, uh, very high uh, waves are experienced in the region, that might mean that an operational wind turbine's first blade rate come, uh, you know, overlap with the first sway mode causing uh, a fatigue damage. So another uh, analysis we have regularly done for the other offshore uh, structures and uh, risers in particular is the foundation fixity, which is actually a, this essentially the soil stiffness measured by the deflection of the uh, tower profile. And this is essentially the sense of idealized point of rotation of the uh, generally closer to the uh, mud line and uh, Essentially, when the angular that allows more lateral motion uh, below the belt mud line causing fixity depth. And in this one, uh, you can see the, uh, the foundation fixity uh, all uh, polar axis all around the turbine. And you can see that uh, 
de, as I mentioned, the sensor packages from SCART uh, turbine experiences a fixed depth along the 30 to 200 degrees axis, much lower uh, of about 28.9 for the control time and the term causes. Uh, uh, and reduce lock time. Overall, like what was this data is to, to update, you know, build finite element models and calibrate them matching the as, as installed. This, this is done via matching the, you know, the easiest way to do it is to match the dynamic response, the natural frequencies and mode shapes of the tower to the uh, finite element models. This is the uh, first approach to make. And the second uh, way that this improves this feedback to the uh, structural models is updating the soil model, which essentially uh, analysis about the soil model. But having access to those can be, uh, can be refined to match actual uh, condition. And one as an additional option uh, to have for a wind farm to more, uh, you know, like instrument further the tower with various strain gauges and accelerometers distributed all along the structure to have a better understanding via, via uh, calculating the bending moments and feeding them all into the structural model and to enhance the understanding for uh, the installation for a wind farm. So in return, this actually provides a possible of service life extension and additional revenue generation through the extended life. And actually this presentation, so what we are uh, experienced from this case was uh, motion monitoring of offshore wind turbines are cost-effective because of the economies of scale it aids the detection and diagnosis of uh, structural integrity problems. And once, uh, if, when, you, when you do structural monitoring of offshore uh, wind turbines, uh, you can uh, detect your monopile foundation performance. And essentially, uh, by doing that, you can improve your uh, simulation models and uh, calibrate them to the as installed uh, conditions, which will uh, extend the service life and reduce the operational ex expenses via reduced maintenance. And this will in return enhance the sustainability of uh, offshore renewable energy in our, in our opinion. And these whole services are available through Hugo North Star Solution Integrated Marine Management System. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. I hope it, was, it wasn't so much disturbed by the internet. Yes, th thank you very much. It's, uh, it, it, it was at points, it's such a shame, uh, an interesting topic, uh, and, and, and really quite topical with the, 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 the massive expansion of offshore wind. Uh, I'll, I'll let Walt have the first few questions. Uh, <laughs> we only have about seven minutes left, so... Uh, yeah. I have a couple of areas I'd like to explore. Uh, uh, Batuhan, I thought you battled on well there. You were broken up a little bit, but the good news was um, when when the, the video or the audio caught back up, we didn't actually lose anything. It was just a little tricky to focus in on what you were saying, but uh, well done on getting through that. I guess my question is, um, you indicated, I mean, these units um, appear to be standalone, if you like. They, they, they have battery power for about a month. The, I, I'm assuming that means you need to physically visit the site to download the data. That, that to me, is, is inefficient and, um, you know, costly and, 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 and carries risk. Uh, have you any consideration to wiring them up to the internet or bringing the data live back via the cabling that's already there to bring the power uh, to shore? Um, I, I'm sure that's been considered. I mean, in, a, in an ideal world, presumably you could wire up a whole a wind farm and then you could actually compare and contrast all of the data from numerous turbines to see which ones were causing you trouble to see which ones were giving you um consistent results and which ones were maybe outliers etc uh, etc et i mean how, how are you progressing uh, bringing this into the, the the internet world where you can see this all on a on a dashboard in your office yeah yeah you are exactly right Walt. 
I think like uh, I have to admit this is actually like a client request. So this is like um, why where they want a really short term, like spot on, like just uh, you know, just point measurement. What we normally do is of course like we are experts in online monitoring. Uh, and we have a range of sensors, like a very compact internet of things. We can have, like, have them, um, you know, easily installable uh, and uh, power over Ethernet power to just minimize the cabling required by the client. So we have a range of solutions. But I, in this case, what we have done is it's a really um, user friendly uh, system. So we have actually gave a really to be honest, half an hour presentation to the uh, clients, offshore engineers, which they were able to retrieve the data during their regular uh, maintenance visits to the turbines, which they then say send us send us back to call it to check them. And this worked quite well actually. That worked uh, for them throughout uh, the time when they have uh, applied the repairs to the uh, wind turbine foundation and. Uh, they made significant cost savings and they made uh, significant, they, they, they gained significant benef benefit from it. But having said that, I think like the, obviously what we are uh, promoting is, it is in fact should be to really reduce the operational expand expenditure via reduced maintenance. As you said, this should be like a, uh, you know, like a compact connected, uh, you know, dedicated structural monitoring that you can access and see each turbine from your desktop and see, okay, everything is looking for, looking good for wind turbine. Of course, we are also working with uh, floating uh, offshore wind turbines and there's a, like a, um, you know, we are currently working on uh, some structural uh, monitoring solutions using really minimal instrumentation, just GPS and accelerometer to uh, derive fatigue and mooring line fatigue and uh, structural integrity monitoring mm -hmm. of uh, floating offshore wind turbines as well. So that's it. Yeah. Another topic we, we yeah. Have. I mean, it, to me, it, it seems like this is almost a retrofit, and and you re we really should be designing this kind of monitoring system into the into the design of the of the monopile uh, itself, and and then you get it all integrated uh, uh, to give you a, a common solution. And whether you use you know, Elon Musk's um, Starlink system for the data uh, or, or, or a mesh uh, network uh, for, for our mobile technology uh, is probably options that you could consider, but it's that certainly seems to be the way that the, the, this industry should be going. But uh, I mean, I'm very, it's very interesting. Thank you, not an area I, I knew much about. I'll, I'll hand it back to, to Daryl. Maybe he has a closing question or, and, and, and can wrap things up, but uh, over to you, Daryl. Yeah, so as, as a closing question, I, I, there's some, obviously really interesting spectral information in that uh, PSD and a dominant direction. Have you correlated that dominant direction with current flows through the arrays or is it more related to wave direction or is it current? Because that will introduce scour. And also I noticed some other spectral peaks in there. Could they be correlated with like the grouting integrity of the, the monopile or other integrity monitoring capability if you had a slightly wider bandwidth? Yeah, um, to first of all, the question about the, the direction is, uh, it's definitely, you know, correlates with the metocean data and mainly driven by the wave direction uh, because of the location of the turbines and, uh, and definitely when you have a scarred uh, foundation, you experience uh, more uh, motions and fixity depth uh, increases. And regarding the um, spectral response, what we do is we do actually carry out some model analysis of various uh, peaks that are constant, consistent in the spectral response over time. Then we do track them over the time and uh, identify, try to identify the sources, as you said. So we do carry out like certain further analysis to feedback to the uh, client. Okay, well, well, I'd like to firstly thank all the presenters, excellent presentations. And uh, yeah, that pretty much concludes the uh, data capture and processing sort of session of the uh, imaging and metrology track. So thank you all and uh, goodbye. Brilliant, thanks guys, excellent. Thank you. Thank you.